focus, with intention behind it. And the intention should be that we meditate on the meaning of the Maha Mantra. After all, we're chanting first to Radharani. Hare is the vocative form of Hara, uh, which means Radharani's role as the Hladuni Shakti, the pleasure energy of Krishna. So uh, when we invoke Radha, uh, this should be uh, a statement of spiritual pleasure, Hare. Uh, this immediately invokes the pleasure energy of the Lord, the Hladini Shakti. And it attracts Krishna's attention. Uh, and who are we chanting to? Krishna. Krishna means the reservoir of pleasure. Uh, and Rama means the giver of spiritual pleasure, bestower of, of uh, ecstasy. Uh, Radha Ramana. Krishna is the giver of pleasure to Radha. So we should understand that this, this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is full of pleasure. And when we chant it, we should feel that pleasure. If we don't, it means that we're chanting with offenses. There are 10 kinds of offenses, which you can read in the uh, scriptures of the esoteric teaching. I'm not going to try to go over them now. But the whole process of chanting is to overcome these 10 offenses. And you'll find that uh, most of them are offenses of thinking. Uh, for example, if we don't accept the absolute Vedic truth, if we think that the Vedas are just another scripture or just another religion or just another philosophy or something like that, uh, if we, if we uh, try to interpret the Vedas as if they were some kind of relative truth, that's an offense. And it's an offense of thinking, an offense of concept, misconception of the holy name. Okay, we should understand that the Vedas, especially the esoteric teaching part of the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Nectar of Devotion, Krishna book, uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and, and those kinds of works, especially the works of the six Goswamis like Brihad Bhagavatamrita and uh, Chaitanya Bhagavat, you know, all of these Vedic works are giving absolute truths. They're not giving relative truths. This is not just another religion. This is the actual personality of Godhead himself directly speaking and narrations about him and about his close devotees. So we should take these things as absolute. They're not relative. They're not to be interpreted. They're to be duplicated and understood in that way. When we can think through the logic of the scriptures and understand why, for example, uh, Krishna presents the topics of Bhagavad Gita in a certain order. And when we can think through his logic and think through his arguments with our own mind, our own intelligence, at that point we have understood it. Until we get to that point, we still haven't understood it. Simply learning by rote is a good start, but it's not enough. We should be able to engage our own intelligence in spiritual logic and understand the real purpose of this esoteric teaching. The purpose of this esoteric teaching is to liberate the conditioned souls from material entanglement so that they can go back home, back to the spiritual world and serve Krishna. So if service to Krishna is both the means and the goal of the esoteric teaching, then we should engage ourselves in that service with determination and faith. And that means that every act of devotional service that we perform should have a specific goal. It is not that we're just running through this routine, you know, uh, j just to do it, just for the sake of doing it. Uh, uh, in the Upade Shamrita by Srila Rupa Goswami, uh, in the second shloka, it says one's devotional service is spoiled when one either breaks the rules and regulations of devotional service or executes them just to do it uh, with no real purpose behind it, no real intention behind it. So our intention should always be, number one, to please Krishna, and number two, to be reinstated in our original uh, constitutional spiritual position in relationship with the Lord, 
in a positive service relationship. Positive service relationship means that we have a role in the Lord's pastimes, His eternal lila, where we provide a particular service to the Lord. It doesn't mean not only just thinking of Him, but actively offering Him some kind of service in one of the five moods of devotional service. What are they? Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. So we should be situated in one of those moods, in one of those roles in Krishna's pastimes and offering him active service according to that role. That's who we are. That's our real identity. And this process of devotional service is to rediscover our actual identity, our actual role in Krishna's pastimes. I remember one time uh, a devotee asked uh, a very advanced devotee from Vrindavan, what is your uh, constitutional position or what is your eternal form in Lord Garunga's pastimes, in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes? And he smiled and he said, well, you're looking at it. Huh? You're looking at it. Anyone who takes up a uh, preaching engagement, uh, spreading this knowledge of the esoteric teaching in the mood of Lord Chaitanya, is part of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Because Lord Chaitanya uh, desired that this teaching should be spread all over the world. So if we do that, if we spread it all over the world, then we are participating in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Huh? Remember, in the spiritual world, or in the spiritual conception of reality, time, distance, and other physical things like that are not they're irrelevant. <laughs> They're irrelevant. What matters is that we have a relationship of service with the Lord. So even if we're separated by 500 years or 5,000 years or 5 million years, uh, and even if we're on another, the other side of the planet or even if we're on a different planet completely, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because spiritually we're connected with Krishna as soon as we chant his name as soon as we serve him, uh, as soon as we try to push forward his purposes and his process, then uh, we are there with Krishna. We're in relationship with Krishna. And that relationship is absolute, therefore it's eternal, transcendental, and that means that no boundaries of space or time or circumstance can come between us. And you can feel this. This is not just a theory. It's not just a philosophy or a theology. You can actually feel, if your heart is open, uh, you can feel Krishna's reciprocation. You can hear Krishna's voice. He, Krishna can drop things into your mind <laughs> at any time. He can remind us of things that we need to know for his purposes, for his service, uh, not for our own service. That's the, the disease. We all suffer from this disease of egotism, selfishness. Uh, we're unwilling to go past our self-created boundaries. We're unwilling to uh, go outside of our comfort zone. Uh, think outside of the box, the little box that we created for ourselves. I, me, and mine. Uh, my, me, and I. I, my, me, my, me, mo, me, mo, me, I. I mean, this is everybody's mind is, is thinking like that. We don't ever think, well, what could I do for Krishna that he would like? Uh, that's our disease. And that's why we're trapped in this material existence, in this material consciousness. Uh, Maya has two uh, actions, the throwing action and the covering action. Uh, Maya throws us into this material body or into a material situation that we don't desire. And we have no idea how we got there. All of a sudden, we find ourselves in a particular situation. Uh, one day we wake up and we're in this material body. Uh, or something happens and all of a sudden we have to deal with it. Uh, it just kind of drops out of the sky on us. We can't help it. That's Maya. And then, because of the material qualities involved, Maya covers our consciousness. Uh, it makes us identify with the material body or the material situation in which we exist. 
and then uh, we accept that as being our identity. Oh, I'm a, a white male Protestant from, uh, from New York, you know, or something like that. We actually identify with that false ego, that false identity, and then we try to act in terms of that identity when it's actually not who we really are at all. And then we wonder why we're not happy. We're not satisfied. Huh? Just like these people laughing here, they're taking their kids to the park. Huh? They think, I am the mother, and this is my child, and we're going to the park to have fun. But what always happens? The child falls and scrapes her knee and starts crying, and then there's a big scene, and everybody has, you know, nobody has a good time, really. Well, why don't they have a good time? Because they're trying to enjoy this material body under the identification of the material identity, the 